Avoid these Warhammer painting mistakes. It's it's sticking within your comfort zone and not pushing out of it. It's the biggest enemy. It's all about control and it's all about refinement. If you maintain those two things, you're always going to end up with a better quality of finish. If something goes wrong, I'm going to amend it. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to notice it. I'm going to fix it. I'm not just going to like stick it out. I think that one of the big mistakes a lot of people make is sticking in their lane too much. I think that's something that is really important. And the only physical way that you're going to get better at that is by we're back after a nice little Christmas break. Mm-hmm. Have a good Christmas, everyone. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, well, actually, no, I say that. I was ill. I don't know, I'm talking rubbish. I was ill. How you doing? But the New Year's and stuff was good. Little break after Christmas it was good. We did our hobby hangout on Discord. Yeah, that was good fun. Mm. First one we've done uh, one of those. We've spoken on the podcast before about how me and James like to hang out while we paint. Mm-hmm. Uh, Discord is obviously great for that. Siege Discord, in, link in the description. Yeah. Uh, you, was, you was new to that sort of thing. So what did you think of it? I wasn't as distracted as I thought I would be. It was quite nice. Like I feel like I, because everyone's painting, there's like kind of natural pauses in the conversation where everyone's suddenly like concentrating on something. And I think I wasn't as distracted as I thought I was going to be, which was nice. See, I really liked it because, and I've always liked chatting and uh, and painting because visually you're doing something and your attention, your visual attention is on that. And you can still communicate without it distracting the visual attention, which is why I've, I've, I've it, of all the things, if you can do anything that's quite engaging while painting, I think that's probably the best thing in my opinion. Um, but yeah, yeah, I've always, always enjoyed hanging out and, and painting. I think it's, it's, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just fun to like talk to some of the listeners and stuff. That was fun. Yeah. yeah it was good. We yeah. do it, uh, do it every now and then, I reckon. Yeah. Well, the biggest reveals over Christmas, of course, was the GW stuff. Joe, Dark Angels fan. Oh Yeah. Are, I, I mean, that, uh, obviously we'd seen the Terminators already. Uh, we? we saw the Knights, the Deathwing Knights, right? Yeah, it's the same box though, right? Or am I getting mixed up? No, there, there was an upgrade sprue for the Terminators. There was the Deathwing Knights, which we'd seen before, but the upgrade sprue was new. And then we saw the new character as well. Yeah, the new, I mean, the new character was the main thing I thought that was... New. I thought the, the new character and the fact that it's all in a box together, I thought was the thing. I kind of had it in my head that we'd seen those. I, don't know I think maybe the- because we've seen the Knights, I'm getting a bit mixed up. But character is sick. What's the character thing? Belial. 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 Yeah. Or Belial. Belial. <laughs> It's not Belial. <laughs> no, it's Belial. It's not Belial. It's, what, it's um, always always a funny thing with like character names. It, you... you, you because they are that kind of like gothic kind of like like specifics kind of way they either always end in an ius like cassius or, or something like that they uh, you know they've always got a bit of a funny funny sort of ring to them so pronunciation is always a bit funny sometimes on them but uh, yeah, fabulous bars the the best one that fabulous gets bar, uh, yeah it gets oh fabulous bill yeah um, but um, <laughs> as the nickname treatment it, yeah belial the i think the model's sick i think it's so cool to see like um a space marine character model definitely like also a terminate model that doesn't just it feels like a lot of them now you see them and you go oh it looks like x model from six months ago or something but he's in a completely kind of fresh pose for yeah um a space marine captain type yeah, character really model um which i think is is excellent um it's quite dynamic pose as well Sword is, sword is good, yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the storm bolter with the setback uh, uh, magazines on the storm bolter is really cool. Actually, often storm bolters have have obviously the, the sickle mag, but then they have um, they're the same as in next to each other. But Belial's is is one setback, one's one's. It's just a really cool little design uh, design feature. Um, little thing I noticed immediately on the model, and I thought it was just something cool, a little bit different. Makes the storm bolter look a bit different as well, which I thought was great. Um, He's got a little friend as well. Yeah, yeah. It just, it reminds me of almost like, I think personally I prefer this model, not even not not even just being biased, but it reminds me of like, you know when the Torgarida model come out and it was like, oh cool, that's like, I can see a lot of people wanting to use that, not just for Torgarida. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's just a cool, there wasn't another model, model that looked like that at the yeah, time yeah. No, for Space Marines. I think this is one of those really. I have no like, attachment to that character at all but i want to paint that model it looks cool yeah so i think it, it's it kind of fits in with the lion model as well it kind of th- fits that i was going to say it's got like such similar without like looking like a ripoff or a copy 
That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it looks completely unique, but it it fits in with that direction, definitely. Um, the Lion, obviously, Miniature of the Year 2023, as voted for by myself. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Look at the disappointment. Uh, I, Dante got a show in. He was like, what? Was he like third? Oh, uh, they just put him in with like... It was the, good. Top 10, mate. Top 10. Yeah. It's good. They didn't even say the number, did they? No, they said the numbers. I don't think they said well, like the, the full top, top 10 uh, numbers. No, they said, top, they said, they said top, top three. They said top, he, was, he was in the running. Let's put they it that said that he was an honourable mention, yeah. which hey, look, basically... It's, it's still an honourable mention, okay? It's like getting a little badge that says, you tried. On it. <laughs> little star badge, given, you tried. Given little the, gold star. Given the number of, of entries in the uh, in the selection, I think being being recognised is uh, is quite a high esteemed honour, actually. So yeah. so, yeah. I'll tell you what, I'm, I, I'm absolutely in love with the uh companions the new models um blatantly fallen that have had a bit of a bit of a, a bit of a, a slap and pulled into place which i don't know about that i don't um, know about that i think they look like rather uh gentlemanly uh followers of the imperium the i'll be honest i kind of overlooked these when like the article first dropped i was like they're oh they're so cool good. like little add-on but then now i've looked at all of the models and all the poses i didn't realize it was like quite a reasonable size as well I only saw the like the two models. I didn't realize it was one of those one like carousels where you could swipe. Yeah, I don't actually know how many models there are. It'll be three um, or five, surely. Well, it looked like when you were scrolling through, when you scroll through on the website, I mean, that's it looks like six, five, isn't it? But um, looks like six. To it me. looks like six, which is a weird kind of. Normally, they're threes or fives, to, aren't to they? Pick. But yeah, that's um, quite interesting. But yeah, they they do look very cool. I love a robe, as with. Uh, I'd be a bit worried as a Dark Angel fan if you didn't like a robe, Joe. Yeah, I, I love a robe, which we've established previously. Um, plenty of robes on these these new models, <laughs> which is good. Uh, uh, next up, that was the the massive upgrade sprue that I was talking about as well uh, on there. So this got me actually. This is probably the thing that got me the most excited um, from from all of it, and I know it's just an upgrade sprue, but. If this is the route and the avenue that they're going down for other releases, I like the implications of this existing. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah. there was the there was the Black Templars one, which was like reasonably substantial. But then this is going down the right road, I think, definitely for me. Because there's like Terminator stuff. There's all sorts in there. Yeah, yeah, they've they've done well. Saying that, like you could, you probably won't be waiting as long as this, but obviously they did that kind of with Cadians as well, mm. um, and we've seen it the use of an upgrade sprue for different things in the kill team boxes. So they are obviously, they do obviously have one eye on opening those possibilities up for people that like different chapters or different regiments and so on. Yeah. And obviously, um, as a dark angels fan, I'm very fond of the helmet options that you get in these, uh, in this upgrade sprue, some, uh, cloaked helmets, which look very cool. I, th I thought you liked the ones with the wings on them. I do like the ones with the wings on them, but if you're not going to have wings, you better have your hood up. <laughs> that's what. That's all I'll say. Ben, um, ben from CS is very, very, very excited by this brew. I think he was also, like you, as a fellow Dark Angel fan, he, mm. he saw that sprue and his eyes went super wide. Yeah, like, I can imagine. Um, do you get a full, is that a full Watcher in the Dark model? Yeah, I think so. In there yeah. as well. I think that's for your Terminators. Yeah, but they... They, uh, they come with one, they, don't they? They should come with one. Yeah. Um, right. when you look at the box art for the big box, um, you kind of see that each group of five terminators. Yeah, but I think you get two upgrade one. sprues in the box. So I think Potentially. That's why. Yeah, that's oh, why they're all the plasma cannons. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that that'd be why then, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool that they've done it in they've worked it out that way, because obviously in the old set you um you used to get in the old Deathwing Terminator box, you used to just get one. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's cool that they've worked it out that way, I suppose. Um, yeah, it's a very cool set. I'm not going to trick myself into uh, saying on air that I'm going to paint it all. You know, I don't he, think, he, he's going to. I don't it. think I'll get round to it. Are you going to buy one though? That's a different question. <laughs> that's a yes. That's a different that's, question. That's a definitive yes. <laughs> I might buy one, but I do acknowledge that I'm probably not going to get it painted anytime soon. Um, it will sit on the shelf, much like my. 30k lion model that's I pre-ordered and is still there. I like that you pre-ordered it when it came out. I was mate, 
We've I was so excited. No, like, I meant I meant because that was so long ago that the model came out. Yeah, and you're like, oh yeah, I pre-ordered it when it came out. I'm like, that model's been out like since I got into the hobby. Like, that's yeah. always just been there. Yeah, I was so excited when that. Uh, I mean, it, well, it was the newest. Was it the last Horus Heresy Primark that they did? Mm, well, Jagatai Jag- was the Jag- last Tite. one. Yeah, Jagatai. Well, that was after the Lion. Was it? Jagatai was like the most recent one. Yeah. 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 Well, talking of me liking a robe. I also love an ethereal and we have a robed ethereal uh, revealed. I don't know if it's exactly a, an ethereal, but it looks like one to me. Um, I'd call that an ethereal. For the for the store anniversary models. I think it's a pretty cool model. It's, again, it's a similar similar thing to what I'm saying with um, Belial, where it's like, oh, cool, there's not currently an ethereal model that looks like that. Do you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. not just a rehash. It's not just a like. It's not a new Primaris Lieutenant that looks slightly <laughs> yeah. different to the other Primaris Lieutenant that looks yeah. the same as the other like, Primaris yeah, yeah. Lieutenant. Yeah. Well, um, when, when, I, when I first saw this, when I first saw it, I thought that it was uh, an Age of Sigma model because I didn't see it in a, on a big, big, um, big, like big screen. I saw it literally on a phone, swiping on my phone and it suddenly came up and I was like, oh, wow. Um, and then I had to look at more into it. It reminds me very similar um, of there's a Lumineth model with a veil across the face. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. It reminds me really of that. And, and um, look, I don't know whether they use the same dolly or the same CAD file or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But it, it just for some reason... It, I think it's different enough to not actually be a copy. Well, no, no. I'm not, I don't I, think it's the same. I don't, I don't think I'm there's not saying anything, it is. All I'm saying is... I don't it, think there's anything like copied over. I think no, it's no, just no, a it's similar... No, no, It's the silhouette of when... I, from scrolling, I just thought someone had painted that model as in the Lumineth one. In, as a thing in, in red colors or converted or something and then i saw it was obviously an official image i was like oh wow um but yeah no really really cool um i think yeah it's got a lot of robes i, think I love got, the, the <laughs> it's got a lot of robes it's got a lot of robes it's got a lot of robes i love the option for the what the hand's holding yeah in terms of what like element uh, yeah yeah like you can you've got four different options there um which is pretty cool yeah i don't know if you have is that not the same thing just painted different colors no, look at the top one. No, they're different. Oh, okay. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, um, yeah I think uh, probably go for fire. Fire looks cool. Can't go wrong with fire. Yeah. Compliments blue skin. Yep. Talking of fire, you got the other store anniversary model. Got a bit of fire on there. I really like this. Can't go wrong with the uh, fire slayers. Speaking of models that look similar to other models. <laughs> yeah, this one does look like a bit more similar to... Uh, the general Fire Slayers models that you'll get. But I suppose there's two sides of the coin because it's like, if you do that, you can't go wrong. Like the fans of the army love that. So I suppose the design of that army kind of as a whole has kind of backed itself into a corner of because they've all got the the hair. and Yeah, you can't do too much. And fire. They have to have it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be Fire Slayers. But I think no. he looks cool. I think he looks cool. It doesn't, not as, it's, it's odd for me to see store anniversary models where there's one Age of Sigma, one 40K, and I think the 40K model is cooler. Because you're, you're normally drawn to the... Normally just drawn, model-wise, I'm definitely more drawn to the AOS I defi- models. But definitely, definitely prefer the the Ethereal. Yeah. They're great. They're both great, but I prefer the Ethereal, definitely. Yeah, it does kind of... Yeah, yeah, I think he does kind of look like more of a standard model than the Ethereal, doesn't he? Right, we've dodged it for long enough then. James... You've started another army. I, I've done. I've done the, uh, the 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 army I've always wanted to do, but never got around to it. So I've started it. The Blood Angels Primaris army. Uh, I did do a little bit. I'm going to throw that in there because I have done a little bit of work on that. But no one's the seen Admech it. army. Oh, the Admech army. That was it. The other army that he's always wanted to do. I told you the Admech army was scratching an itch, and I've scratched that now, and that's done and dusted. That was a 2023 painting itch that was scratched firmly and left in 2023. <laughs> I'm taking yeah. credit for that win, by the way, yeah. of him not doing that army. It's, yeah. it's, it's not a win. It's not a win in the slightest. But anyway, um, yeah, so I have started a, a Mordian Iron Guard army. Um, always been a massive fan of Mordian Iron Guard. They're actually, this, they're after Blood Angels, they were like the second Warhammer model that I ever painted. So I painted like a Blood Angel when I was uh, from the second Ed box. And then, uh, and then bought, um, bought oh, I, was, I was bought, I think, uh, just a Mordian sergeant model that I'd done a little bit of my first ever conversion on. So I like cut the gun off and replaced the gun. I thought it was like, I thought it was amazing. <laughs> like, literally. Um, so that model that I've had since I was a kid and that, that I painted 28 years ago, uh, sat always on my painting desk. It's always 
followed me around and traveled everywhere and gone everywhere with me. And, um, and yeah, so I decided to, to embark on a 28 year old refresh of, of that model and a whole ton of other models to go with it and do an army of them. Um, I had also been searching for uh, the, the painting color scheme for their tanks because you can't find it. I, I literally couldn't find it anywhere. Like I, I had a, like an official kind of like Mordian Iron Guard tank color scheme. And um, I, I've got um, painting uh, tanks by uh, Sisdale Painting Tanks. It's an old painting book. And I was going through it the other day, just literally just looking for something for Adam here for his still legion, actually, funny enough. And I turned the page and there's a, there's a Mordian Iron Guard Hellhound that's painted by Dazza. I didn't know it was painted by Dazza until I posted the image going, here's, an, here's this color scheme. And then Daz messaged me going, that's the model I painted. I went, I have the colors. And he's like, it's like years ago. I can't remember. I was like, okay, fine. So <laughs> so I'm going to have to try and work it out um, and see what the colors are. But it's really cool actually to actually see what their tanks can look like. The, can I have the colors of this thing you painted? How long ago? I don't know. A long time ago. He said 5,000 years. I don't think it's that long though. <laughs> but uh, but uh, But... I, I'm going to try and, and do it justice. And, uh, and, and because it is in Sistel painting tanks, I'm going to take that as a gospel official colorway for their tanks. Cause yeah, I think, I think cause, that's cause, fair enough, cause I, I literally looked everywhere and cannot find, um, an official color scheme for the tanks at all whatsoever, uh, apart from that book. So, so I'll be using that, but yeah, I, I managed to, in, uh, two, three days, I managed to build clean, repin, rebase, barrel drill, absolutely every single one of the 110 models and then undercoated them and also painted them in their main color, which is the best blue ever enchanted blue. Um, so yeah, so they are already, and, and the thing is now I've got that big swathe of infantry done. That's my project for six months. That's my six month project. So I'm going to do that every month. I'm going to be doing bits of that and get that done. Six months, 110 models. I'm calling it on air. It's not going to happen. I'm going to do it. I'm going to I, do it. I have to look, you know, I'm usually all for a little bit of a uh, bit of banter, a little bit of banter with with James and his promises and things like that. But I have personally witnessed James complete two armies, albeit one of them was an Imperial Knights army, so not a lot of models, but big models. Two armies um, in a short, short-ish space of time uh, under, you know sticking to deadlines and things and both were completed but he had a purpose for completing those of like i'm going to this tournament where there was like a purpose in the gaming sense so with nothing with no one to hold him accountable other than himself i'm not sure this is gonna happen uh, but uh, here's the here's the thing here's the thing they he he is not he said on air everyone has heard it i think that's as good as painting for a um, tournament or something like that. I think that's as much of um, uh, an incentive. I the, think the the purpose is to just do it so that I can make you eat your words. So, so all that, yeah. So, I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to say. Also, it could just be to prove you wrong. That's um, that. I'd rather do that than than play a game personally. I, uh, if my if my my motivation would be to prove <laughs> George wrong rather than rather than enter a tournament. Um, so yeah, it could just also be that. That's as much of a motivation as anything, I think. I can't. Um, I, I can't wait. I can't, I, I can't wait. Yeah. So so it's it's quite it's, yeah. There's quite a lot of infantry, and then I've I've been hoarding up a couple of tanks and things that I want. Um, and I'm going for a real classic classic color scheme. So I'm doing. Um, I'm not going to be doing goblin green bases. I had a couple of people message me going when they saw that I was doing it, going, oh, you're going to do goblin green base rooms. What color are the base rooms going to be, James? Tell them. Oh, could we? I I really thought like, we were going to should we not this year? <laughs> I was like thinking to myself, yeah, that'd be good if we like straight into the new year and we leave we leave the base room thing behind. It's a 2020. But it's a how long are we in? Like 20, 20 minutes or something. Here we are. Yeah, so it's a 2023 thing, the base room thing. I think 24 needs to be something new. We need to find a new a new thing. But you'll notice that he's dodging the question here because because well because the base rooms are going to be grey, okay, and I'm going to explain why. So Mordian Iron Guards are city fight specialists, so they are adapt at fighting in a city environment because of the Mordian and where they grew up, and obviously the different levels and the tri tetrarchs and all that kind of stuff. Um, so because they are an urban combat specialist unit or, or, or regiment or whatever, um, 
Gray bases makes perfect sense. And because I've done the, the dress uniform is so bright and vibrant blue, having any other kind of like base rim color just wouldn't really work. It kind of contrasts and offset the blue quite nicely. So I'm nodding to the narrative and law about what they what they do. And also it works from the, from the paint, painting perspective. <laughs> he's, he's happy with that one. The, the fact that, by the way, George is trying to take you doing gray base rims as a win for his brown base rim campaign is mental because well, well brown, brown base, base rim, rim became old base rim just anything other than black I oh, believe did it was it? The, oh, yeah. oh did it because <laughs> grey base rim is way more close to a black base rim than brown he's on the say. path he's on the righteous path he's taken a step outside of black and soon he'll be on steel, steel legion steel legion drab surely makes sense for them not at all they're not steel legion do you know the worst the worst type of brown base rim is when the actual basin is like urban grey and then it's a brown base rim. That's the one I get the least. Right. Oh, well, I'm not doing this again. Can we, I'm can not we doing, draw me can in we, now. Can we, can I'm we, not having it. Right, I just I'm not doing this again. Say this for, for all listeners and viewers. We are putting base rims to bed now. That's it. That's, that's, that's. Paint them whatever you like. Yeah, that's, that's going to be the end of 2024, it. any no, base rim colour you no want. No cake, no base rim. Okay, <laughs> yeah. we're done. Do you know what was funny? I did my like post on Instagram, um, like the art versus artist thing. And like I was zooming in because it's a big, it's like you, you crop. So I didn't put any of the base room colors in anyway. And as I was doing it, I was like, thank God, because my two favorite models on here, neither of them have a black, <laughs> <laughs> neither of them have a black base room. One of them's brown and one of them's gobbly green. So yeah. Um, so I had a bit of a humbling moment doing that. But um, so that's, that's yeah. next. Any, any base room colors you want in 2024? So, so that is the next the the next six months for 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 me is going to be working on those. Just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world class team here at Seed Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget. Whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army, we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at cstudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off of your first commission with us by using code PAINT5. Now back to the show. Uh, let's get into some listeners' comments. Just quickly first though, uh, if you are watching this show and you do watch every single week, it would really, really help us out if you could hit that subscribe button. You might have noticed that you see this show on your homepage every single week on YouTube, but you are not subscribed. You notice that over 70% of you are not subscribed to the channel. Uh, it allows us to bring these episodes for free every single week. You'll get notified when we do new uploads and you'll also see all of the other amazing content on the channel. Jim Rat 83 says, uh, great show. Been listening the past two months and working my way through the back episodes too. Painting while listening and enjoying the banter, inside jokes, life advice, and everyone's candid honesty about struggles and painting. Looking forward to another good year. Please keep up the podcast videos. Awesome. Life advice, I would take with a pinch of salt for any of us, I think. <laughs> But, definitely, most um, definitely. But other than that, yeah, good to hear. Glad to hear it. Sidetracked2715 says, for me, best motivation is an event. Sign up for an event, low stakes, maybe 1,000 points, and it forces you to lock in a force and paint it. Parts of it will be a slog, but at the end, you'll have 1,000 points you can put on the table and look like a cohesive army and touch up after the event if you feel like it. So that's in reference to the episode we've done about motivation. That's kind um, of what we were just touching on with... Uh, you know, I was saying I'd seen James complete those armies and you were saying, oh yeah, but you had an event. Um, it's kind of the, kind of the same thing, isn't it? Works really well. Like it's the best thing. I think having a deadline or target to achieve, I think you, you need that, especially when, especially look from what I'm saying now about my army, just obviously you need something to visualize to, to keep you on track. Uh, just checking it is to the end of June. Isn't look, it? It's it setting is. in now. It's, it's setting checking, in. He's realizing what he's just, agreed it's to. Just, it, it, it's, it's the end of June, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Why don't you two organize a game? You can play with your sons of Horus. <laughs> <laughs> My sons of Horus versus this morning on. Problem is, I've never played like 40k or any tabletop games. Oh, so, there we go. Yeah. See, now he's back. Now I've got the excuses. No, sorry. Uh, Faces and Bases says, uh, My mate paints. Faces and Bases says, My mate masks his minis with cling film as well. And it's a clever idea. That's in reference to James's little hobby hack from a few weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, just make sure you let the paint dry first before removing the cling film to reduce risk of getting paint on the mini. That's a good point. That's a very handy tip. Uh, also, I had the exact same reservations about magnifying headsets as James, but my better half who worked in the optician industry for a decade advises us that our eyes won't get weaker from using lenses, much like we can't fix eyesight issues by making people wear weaker prescriptions. 
at worst you'll get eye ache from looking at things uh but as with anything taking breaks is golden yeah so so i i um I, I I thought I my thought process to it was my logic of of it making your eyes worse. I knew that was probably wrong. I said that actually on the episode, but um, I just I've tried them and I cannot get used to them. I just can't get used to them. Well, I'll say, Joe, taking a step on the path. I've ordered some yesterday. <laughs> so, nice. Uh, I've gotten to the point where I feel like my lack of being able to see things has like gone past my brush control. If you get what I mean. So like after painting for a few years, I feel like I can now paint better than I'm capable of seeing. Because I don't have great eyes anyway. It it's even good for like we've spoken before about taking pictures and viewing something on a bigger screen to see mistakes and stuff. Even if you're not using them to paint, it's good to spot mistakes as well. Yeah, because like, I found that I was doing that a lot because I, I I can't see this. Like I, I've got the dexterity to be able to paint certain things, but I can't see what I'm doing. If you get what I mean. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, can I give them a go? See how, see how that comes back. It might be one of those things where like now all of your stuff looks terrible because you can see it in detail. Yeah. So might regret that move. Don't yeah. look at your old models with the headset. I'll say that. Actually, the ones that you've taken pictures of will probably be fine. The so look at your comp <laughs> look at your comp pitch, uh models with the headset. Uh no, because I'm not gonna I'm gonna want to like re enter them into a competition. That's not happening. It's not happening. I'm gonna try and use them as little as possible. <laughs> as i as, as i said you 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 shouldn't you just shouldn't have got them in that if that's the case <laughs> uh kgp277 says i saved two squads of marines with the buffing toothbrush trick so james you finally got one person on earth who's used the trick that you have i am quite sure there are more than just one person out there but to that individual person you're more than welcome Make sure that in a future uh, future mistake or issue you electrify it and use an electric one <laughs> Uh, he adds further on to that. <laughs> the next comment they come in is going to be like, I've ruined two space marines using the electric <laughs> <laughs> Uh They said in another comment as well, uh, nothing's better for motivation than waking up slightly earlier uh, and paint for one hour every morning before work, etc. Uh, drink some coffee, listen to an audio book. Every day you see the progress and it's addictive. And yeah, same thing for the gym as well. That's definitely... That's definitely the the way to get painting every day, which is the thing we spoke about uh, in one of the previous episodes. Like getting up earlier and making some time to do it before work. Um, it's quite good as well because it will relax you just before you go to work uh, or if you've got a commute that's maybe a bit stressful on a train crammed with somebody or stuck in traffic or something, that bit of relaxation in the morning is quite good. So. I suppose it depends what type of person you are as well because I found this um, uh, tangentially related like with music, like my bandmates. Not I'm one of those people who gets really, really motivated and like hyper-focused in the mornings. But like towards the evenings, I like start to lose concentration. But I know a lot of people that are like, oh, I'll do my best work at like 3 a.m. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I feel like a lot of people might be kind of the opposite of that of like, oh, I set aside like an hour in the evening to paint like before bed or something like that. That might be their equivalent. I think for me, it's more practicality in terms of, you know, what else that has to take priority in your day. For me, I've, I'm able to find more time in the evenings than I am in the mornings personally. I've just got other other things in the mornings and, and other routines to adhere to in the morning. So um, for me, yeah, it's definitely more of an evening thing. And I think the relaxation view of it that we spoke about a little bit is helping in the evenings as well. I, I'm definitely a 5.36 PM kind of guy for painting. That's the, that's the peak of when my paintings at the moment I get in. <laughs> it's definitely the time for me. No, uh, afternoons and evenings always work, always work best for me personally. Like, um, yeah, um, morning. I just don't have don't have time. So yeah, afternoons yeah. and evenings. I was having this exact conversation about the gym with a friend the other day actually because I'm I go to the gym after work mm. and they go to the gym before work and I've tried both, um, but personally, it's more more of a physicality thing. Like I prefer to have eaten and and have more energy through the day kind of thing. Whereas they were saying how like. No, it feels way better to go to the gym in the morning before work and on an empty stomach and this and this and this. So it's like just another example of everyone being different and it and whatever suits you, I suppose. Yeah. Either way, though, I think the like just setting an hour to paint every single day things. Whatever hour you're picking, if you're picking an hour and you're sticking to it every day, then you're going to benefit 100%. Uh, we can finally talk about this. <laughs> uh, Mathletics says this podcast has fast become the place for both miniature painting and nose ring fans. <laughs> That was, of course, the top-rated comment on uh, on episode a couple of weeks ago because we had a little. Uh, if you saw the blooper episode, 
uh, exclusively for our patrons and Discord members, you will know that we had a, a little bit of fun yeah. <laughs> just before Christmas with that one. Yeah, that was... Uh, do you know what was the funniest thing about that? For those that didn't stick around right to the end on the episode either, you might not notice, but we put a... I, I'm, I, let's just let's just say this week I'm lacking a certain piece of jewellery. Yeah, put it yeah we put a fake nose ring on James as a response to the constant messages we get about, <laughs> and comments we get about me and George having a nose ring. Um we came up with it on the show, basically. Like we, we almost in like real time had the idea of like how funny it would be to give James a fake nose ring on the episode. Yeah, which we had to cut out of the episode so we didn't spoil it. Yeah, and then the um, following week, James was present with his little uh, clip on nose ring. But then, so if you did watch the last, I think it's the last episode. Mm-hmm. Actually, the last episode that was an actual episode, not the compilations. If you did watch that but didn't make it right to the end, just go back and watch the last like thirty seconds, and you'll see James's reaction to. Uh, having to take it off. But the um, the funniest thing about that was that like, it's it was so small and like, you couldn't really notice it that much that uh, when George was editing it, he took a screenshot and put it in our like podcast uh, Slack channel. And I was like, well, it's just a picture of James. Like, what's he, what's he saying? Like he was saying, to, he was saying it to be funny. Like, look at how the nose ring looks for James. And I was like, what? <laughs> I don't get it. Like, Which is ironic, really, because really, when we was filming the episode, me and you couldn't stop laughing because of oh, how I could not. That's another thing that's in the bloopers thing. We were recording for about 30 seconds before I just broke down. <laughs> like, the first moment I looked at him, I just couldn't couldn't do it. I I, I, I was fighting the urge to either sneeze or, or, or to knock it out because it was literally irritating. I was like, this is the most awkward thing in the world. So I think you, you settled into it quite quickly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you settled into it, yeah. yeah. The funniest thing was that he'd like gotten used to it and he was being dead serious and then I'd like I'd almost forget that he had it in and then I'd notice it again oh the whole episode I was just trying to look at Jewel pretty much <laughs> Mojo Jojo says so just watching the Hobby Hacks video compilation and I must have missed the mystery compressor bolt originally anyway I thought I'd stick it in the bath and have a look and he's actually included an image with this one. Oh, okay oh my <laughs> oh my god wow oh I mean yeah that's not good that's the uh that's why you do it, I suppose. <laughs> uh, and for anyone who, uh, I think we'll, we'll try and display the picture here. <laughs> for anyone who doesn't take the bite out of your compressor, that is the uh, that is the reason why you should uh, take that out after every session and uh, leave some paper towel underneath the compressor because you will end up with a river that's blacker and darker than Mordor by the looks of it from that photo. So I will so, say yeah. it's relative to the environment you're in. Like it's it's from moisture build up inside. Yeah, if you're in like yeah. a dry climate, it's probably not going to be that bad. But. Yeah, mine, I mean, again, I don't use it too often anyway, but mine's never actually been bad. You know what I mean? I've never had like a, it's definitely nothing. It's definitely not as bad as that. <laughs> no. uh, Vicky Goldsmall says, a uh, little late to the video, but I'm an organic chemist and I listen to the podcast while in the lab, generally running uh, reactions, working up or isolating chemicals. I generally do rewatch videos at home because I'll be in the lab and think, oh, that's a good point or tip technique to try, but we'll have to table it. Uh, love the podcast and find a lot of joy uh, when small amounts of chemistry slash science intersects with painting and hobbying. <laughs> Wow. Uh, currently play Chaos Space Marines and Tyranids, but just picked up the Tower Pathfinder Kill Team. Joe, that uh, relates to you mm-hmm. uh, for Christmas. Hoping this isn't the start to another army, but we'll see. I mean, well, I mean, there's a lot com- there. Come on, it's got to be the start to another army. That's 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 literally always. The, if you get the- as, if you get as stressed out with building them as I did, then it probably won't be the start <laughs> to another army. But uh, but painting them's fun, so that could could sway you about round again but what was it organic chemist yeah that's really interesting it's just another one where it's like you wouldn't think are you sh- I'm, I'm not judging you- the listeners but what are you doing listening to us like you've got important <laughs> stuff to be doing <laughs> like oh yeah there must be some like really scientific like lecture or something to be listening to or like audio book or something and then you got yeah you I got think us. my favourite one is the, the guy the guy who, who works on F15 Eagles um, and it just made me think that exact thing you just said just made me think of like do you, do you ever have you ever seen the film Hot Shots? When you're, like, you're I never a kid? saw Hot Shots. Hot Shots no. But like it's like it's like that, or uh, like where like the the plane, like the the not the wing, but like the missile rack will fall off, like rather than the missile. Or something yeah, like that. Like, it's just not riveted something. Right. Yeah, like, and it yeah. gets down to like the reasons why. And he's like, well, <laughs> so this, this, is, this is a podcast. This is a Warhammer <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's really cool though. It's crazy. The um, it, the biggest thing that's surprising about it to me, as funny as it is to like think about them listening to this while doing something important, um, 
the funniest thing is like realizing the variety of people that are into Warhammer. Yeah. Like all these different kinds of. There's, cl- there's clearly no crossover point like at all. There's no like typical like, oh, that sort of person into Warhammer or that people in that job like Warhammer. Like it's, it's all over the place, isn't it? Which yeah. is cool. Uh, just quickly before we get into the main topic, uh, we would love it if you listen to this uh, podcast on any of the audio platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere like that. If you could leave us a rating or a review, that would really, really help us to bring in these episodes every single week. And if you're watching on YouTube, please feel free to head over there as well and leave us a rating. Thank you very much. If you're enjoying the show and you want to get even more painting tips and techniques from us here at Siege, head over to our Patreon. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a catalogue of over 250 PDF and video tutorials covering a variety of techniques, from our foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses and much more. We also have a tier just for you podcast listeners to help support the show. So if you want to take your painters to the next step and make the most of your hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash cstu. So before we get into the main topic, we're in 2024 now, and we announced on our last episode that we was going to do the official paint perspective Warhammer calendar. So the idea for that is in the spirit of October and March from a crag, those sorts of things. We've got a little painting challenge that we've set for both ourselves and the community. So we're going to be taking part as well. And every single month we've got a different theme. So January is now officially known as Bill Tanuary for uh, Eldari. So the idea is paint anything Eldar and uh, share it with us on the Siege Studios Discord or on Instagram, hashtag paint perspective or hashtag Bill Tanuary. And uh, what we're going to do at the end of the month, we're going to try and do a little bit of a roundup. So if you want to get featured on the episode, uh, submit it in there. We'll take a look at them. And we'll also take a look at the ones that we've painted ourselves. Maybe have a little bit of a, a bit of a judging around amongst ourselves as well. Yeah, I, I would also, just as a reminder, it doesn't have to be like a full model. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, even for us, sometimes we're going to be doing like, oh, you know, we might paint a, a head or it might be a base in decoration for something else. Or, but it's just in that theme. Um, full models are great, though, if you can do full models and even better. Yeah, I think I'm going to try and do four models as much as possible. But if time doesn't allow, then I'll either do a, I'll either start a four model or a, yeah, like a head or something to put on a base. That's always fun. Yeah, that that is exactly exactly what I'm going to be doing with with it for my Mordians. They're going to have a different enemy on a couple of bases scattered through the army. I've figured this one right out. <laughs> well, by the time you finish your Mordian army in six months, you'll have six different uh, chapter heads. To there, put we on go, your bases, there we go. There we go. That's exact. That's exact. Exactly it. Absolutely. That's exactly it. Okay. Topic for this week: things to avoid. We were thinking that there's probably going to be quite a few people getting back into the hobby or picking up the hobby for the first time uh, after the festive season. Uh, so we wanted to do a little roundup, some mistakes that we've made and some things that we've seen others make, try and steer people along the uh, on the right path. Yeah. Anyone got any uh, initial thoughts and beginner's mistakes that people make? So like once you've once you've made your model, obviously you, you put it together, make sure it's all cleaned, etc. Like I think one of the first things that can go wrong and and it really is like the foundation upon which everything else is built on is is the the the, the undercoat or the prime um and and it's what it's kind of like a two-pronged kind of thing with this like the first thing is obviously to use uh, an appropriate spray that is a primer i think that's the first thing um like there are a lot of colored cans out there from games workshop and from other companies etc cetera, etc cetera. um i think actually using a spray can which is a primer is is the first thing just not using an appropriate colored can to stick a layer of paint on like uh, paint needs something to stick onto the model and by just putting the main color on with a spray can first that doesn't give you the best foundation to then do everything else on so i'd always advocate priming the model that's the first thing so with a black with a white with a gray with any of those i would always advocate just just actually putting a prime layer on before putting a colored prime uh, before putting a, a colored base coat on top of the, that that primer that's a, that is actually a good tip that i don't think gets pointed out enough is that a lot of people see the kind of colored spray cans that you can get yeah and they just assume that because it's a spray can it must also be a primer yeah it's not and not all of them are some of them are but they'll specifically tend to say prime primer or um you know or they'll you know, the the brand itself might um, specifically outline that all of their cans are primers or something like that. But yeah. just because it's in a can and it's for miniature wargaming, it, it's not necessarily a primer. Yeah, you, like primer. paint paint needs something to adhere to. Like it needs it needs it. Like and, and if you're and also the other thing you've got to think about is like um, is like you're you're putting several layers onto that model, and a lot of people are worried that, that you know it's going to be too thick or whatever. As long as you, which leads me 
really like nicely onto my onto my next point, which is actually just using the primer correctly. Um, holding the percussion cap on the can down and just spraying like crazy, like is 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 not controlled at all whatsoever. Um, and you've got to think that every kind of movement that you do with a can effectively is adding a layer onto that model. So by holding it down, depressing and consistently firing it at the model, whilst then concentrating on all changing the angle of the model to then make sure that you paint every part of it, it's completely uncontrolled. Whereas what you should do is you should burst fire and do a pass. So it's a sim single burst while you're doing a movement and then change the angle of the model every time that you do that, because then you're going to get a consistent layer on that model as you're, as you're undercoating it with the primer. Um, that is going to give you a much better foundation for then everything else that you do on top of that. And again, as, we, as I've said, like do a prime, first of all, with a black, white or gray. Chaos Black has been around for 20 plus years. Like, I, I remember it right from when I was a kid all the way back. Like it's, it's, it's been around a long time. It's designed to be an undercoat or a primer use it for that if that makes sense i would stress as well that that's particularly important depending on the material of the models you're using yeah so you could probably get away with it on plastic if you like make a bit of a mistake like that but if you've got uh, particularly like resin models or metal mod metal models priming them is like so 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 important whereas you might like get away with it and might not realize you've been making like a bit of a mistake with the plastic ones it's important to sort of know the materials that you're working with as well and that they will have different properties yeah yeah i, I totally absolutely and 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 the thing is is like by being a bit more controlled with the actual execution and by not holding the percussion cap down and by doing singular bursts with, while moving the can and also after the after you've done each burst, then alternating the angle of the model, you're just going to have a much smoother finish and without the fear of putting loads and loads and loads and loads of layers, progressive layers onto the surface of that model. Um, because what you should effectively do is do a couple of bursts and move the model and that should give you the first sort of thin layer of undercoat on the model and then you do a secondary secondary set of bursts that then put the next layer on and it becomes very very quick once you get in the rhythm and, and method of doing it um simply holding the can down and spraying like crazy and turning the model at the same time you, you just you're just every overlap is just adding a greater weight of, of paint onto the surface of that model and especially when you've got some really refined details like it's all about control and it's all about refinement yeah also potentially something that maybe isn't outlined enough or specified enough because it potentially seems obvious, but when you're um, doing the spray in, in in the manner that that you're describing, James, uh, keeping all the sprays in the same direction, yeah, rather than going back and forth, like backwards and forwards, because it's like you're just going to get a cleaner if everything's going in the same direction. Similar to when you're applying paint, really, I suppose. Um, yeah, as I said, like it, it is all about control and refinement which I, I, I always go on about and always bang on about but it if you maintain those two things you're always going to end up with a better quality of finish always like you just if you're being careful and taking things taking your time on it and actually thinking about how each spray that you do is adding something to that model like it, it all it all adds up you know so so yeah i guess uh my thing that really stuck around with me for a bit longer than it should have was you always hear about thinning your paints. And I think when you're a beginner, especially, because you don't have like much reference or I guess like muscle memory for like what sort of consistency you should be going for. Mm -hmm. I always went on the side of like over thinning in the sense of the paint was uncontrollable because it was like running off the model, uh, sorry, running off the brush and also like getting terrible coverage. Like it's taking like six, seven, eight coats to do like a nice base coat, which is just like obviously massively time consuming. I think that, People get a bit too caught up in it, maybe. Like, because obviously you don't want to not thin your paints because you don't, we will hear like the horror stories, right? But I don't know. I think, I think people talk about it like a lot. And it's the question that I hear a lot is, oh, how much should I thin my paint? And people get like way too nuanced in the nitty gritty of like ratios. And like when you see this in like uh, comment sections on tutorials, it's like, oh, well, like what's the dilution ratio for this paint or this paint? It's like, I don't think that people realize that it's kind of just a feel thing and it's, not necessarily what someone else is doing. You need to do the exact same thing because you might not be doing the exact same amount of brush pressure as that person and you might have had the brush in your hand for longer. It might be a different size brush and so on. The, 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 other, the other thing with that is also, as, as always, like we always say, like, like every paint has a personality, even within the same range of paints. And this is before we talk about like chemical makeups. Uh, it's conveniently had someone that deals with like chemistry. It's one of the, one of the <laughs> listeners. But, but like 
one run of paint might have a slightly different chemical makeup or might have X amount percentage more of sort of medium or pigment. There is going to be some area of discrepancy between the two production runs or the different runs of that same branded named paint. I'm sure you've had so, it where you've like bought one paint and then you've re-bought it later it's, on when you run yeah, out and it's completely different. hundred percent. Yeah. I've had, I've had two, uh, I've had two flesh tones before that were, one was more pink and one was more, more brown, you know? So like uh, it, and they're the same, they're exactly the same, uh, exactly the same paint, uh, paint color. And I think that's one of the things that like, you can't always take those things as gospel. It is very much like you said, like having muscle memory and learning that thing. The other thing as well is that, like, uh, there isn't one singular paint consistency. And I think that's something also to be conscious of. Um, we obviously, we, we talk about glazes, we talk about a wash, not, not the thing that you just get out of a pot and put on a model, like actually making one using a paint and actually learning how to make a wash layer from using just normal acrylic paint. Um, the other thing is, is like there, there are loads of, again, using my favorite words, which are control and refinement, like there are loads, there are loads of different stages of dilution for, and you have to take each one of those stages as a different tool for a different job. And I think sometimes just thinking singular, like, oh, well, I just need to dilute it to this. Doesn't, you need to flip it and start thinking, right, okay, well, that's great for doing this. This is diluting it this much is great for doing this. Diluting it this much is great for doing this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the way from like just blocking in through to sort of like gla glazing at the other end of the spectrum. And I think understanding that you've got a much greater scope of dilution and stages within that dilution will help you hugely. Like it will really, really give you a better, better control of paint manipulation. I think also we we talk a lot, uh, we've touched on at least over the 30 episodes or whatever we've done so far um, about critical thinking and actually making, uh, actually observing what's going wrong, not just like sticking it out kind of thing. Like um, I think some of the things I've done probably in the past, especially with over thinning, is like notice it but then just like not correct <laughs> and like just carry on that's really hit for me you saying that because i remember thinking like well everyone says to thin your paints so like i must be doing it wrong like in the application of the paint not thinking well you're just adding too much water do you know what i mean yeah yeah so rather than like like if you've over thinned it and then you've noticed that and gone this isn't right like while you're painting the amount of time that i would just stick it out and go oh well this must be correct and just keep going and then as you say, the coverage is rubbish. You're doing loads of different coats. Like if you notice something's wrong, just have that initiative to be like, okay, I'll change that then. I know it's annoying because you're like, you're ready to paint. There's already been so much set up. That's the number one reason why I left it was like, but I just want to paint mm -hmm. and now I'm here painting. Like I don't want to have to stop that, amend this issue and then get to paint again after. But it will be so much worth it. If you actually like fix the issue that you notice. It'll be I way think worth that it. extrapolates to like other techniques as well, just kind of in general. Like if, if you get this gut feeling that like something's wrong, yeah. Not necessarily that I don't necessarily mean in the sense of like, oh, I'm not good at this yet. But I mean like you know you can kind of just tell that something's like not right, then yeah. not ignoring that and actually sitting and thinking about, okay, maybe I need to look up a video on YouTube on how to thin my paints properly and what consistency I'm looking for. Do you know what as well? It's sometimes, especially with techniques and stuff, like just having that keeping that um, in your mind of like, okay, if something goes wrong, I'm going to amend it. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to notice it. I'm going to fix it. I'm not just going to like stick it out. Having having that across everything. Because the, the thing is, you might not necessarily be doing something wrong, but something in that scenario isn't working. So just acknowledge that it's not working and, and yeah. maybe try and figure out how to how to fix it and trying to count on those mistakes in real time rather than being like this is something i need to improve on later is how you actually start getting better as a painter like doing that is how you will see the improvement yeah it's not making a mistake and going okay i think next time i'm going to fix that it's like right okay we're in the moment i've done this thing it's not quite right it's not quite what i'm expecting it's not quite what the outcome is in the tutorial that i'm watching or that i'm following how do we correct this let's stop take a breath let's do some research or some experimentation and figure out how we're going to solve the problem rather yeah. than just like oh that's something that i'm not good at moving on the, the biggest, again, the biggest annoyance of that is that you're there ready to paint and you don't get to do that because mm. uh, I, I get why that's annoying, which is probably why, I don't know if this is necessarily a good beginner tip or not, um, but it's probably why it's a good idea to do something that we've said before, which is have a couple of different projects on at once because potentially you've only got half hour where you really want to be painting. Something like that over thinning or whatever has just gone wrong um 
You can pick the next. You, you can, can just move on to this other thing rather than having to deal with that right now mm-hmm. if you don't have the time to do that or if you know that that's just going to annoy you because all you want to do is paint for now. You can just move on to that other thing and and maybe do that instead. Um, don't know if I would necessarily recommend juggling multiple projects for a, a flat out beginner, but that is good down the line to have. I yeah, think. I think that's one of the things I didn't appreciate for the longest time about like what, when people do competition painting or high display painting, you hear people talk about like, oh, how many hours something took. For the longest time, I didn't really like compute what that meant. But like, that's where most of that time sink is going is like correcting mistakes. It's not, oh, it took me, it's not like, oh, I'd done the base coat in like 400 passes with like colored water. Like, to, but it's not that. It's the fact of every time there's anything that's not quite right, even if it's only like 99 out of 100, it's stopping and fixing it before you're moving on. Yeah, you know, like completely redoing whole areas because like, yeah. it doesn't look exactly how you wanted it to look. Like, yeah. yeah. I think that that's a really, really good way to combat the over thinning thing because I, the amount of times I just left it and I'm just thinking, oh, I should have just dealt with it. Right. I, I, th- I, th- I think definitely one of the things that I would say to a beginner is to not have false expectations. I think that's something that is really important, um, especially, I mean, nowadays, especially with all the box arts and stuff that are out there, like from any manufacturer back in sort of like when I started like in second edition, like the box arts were still great. Like they were really, really uh, still well executed, but then they've not got the level of refinement or the level of intricacy that box arts do have nowadays. And I think one of the things is it can, it could potentially be quite apprehensive when you've made that model and you've got it and you physically seeing it in 3d when you've built it compared to a 2d version of it is like a massively different thing. Um, so, so seeing it in, in the flesh in a 3D object that you've made and then looking at the box art that's 2D and going, oh my, I have to try and, if you start out like, and you're not trying to put your own color scheme on it or whatever, and you're just trying to copy the box, it's quite a big Everest to climb. I think having, not having false expectations and purely just, just going, right, okay, I'm going to try and paint this. I'm going to try and paint it in line with that, but it's my first model. If it's not as smooth as that, or if it, if I, that detail is not as visible or whatever, or like, you know, I think those things uh, you mentioned experiment a few times in, 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 in this episode so far. And I think that is the first, some of the first things that you should do as a painter is begin that beautiful journey of air experimentation in miniature painting, which is learning all the key fundamental things that that first step into miniature painting really gives you. We, we say it all the time. It's about muscle memory, pressure management and the brush and all those things. And the only physical way that you're going to get better at that is by doing it and taking those first steps and learning those mistakes those mistakes a lot of people think mistakes are negative which i personally don't think they are at all like i think that you have to have negative and i say that in in speech marks you have to have negative experiences or not it not turning out exactly as you want to teach you how to make it go right because there will be a part of it that you do and you're like oh actually i did that right and I've got that to be smooth or I've got that laid or the paint behaved when I put it there or whatever. And those are the little building blocks which make you progress on the journey of miniature painting. And I think that's really important, not having high, like super high expectations when you first start. I think like in a more extreme version of the box art thing that you said, like nowadays with like Instagram and stuff, it's like completely ruined people's perspective on things. Yeah. And coming from the sort of like Instagram generation myself, like getting into the hobby only in like 2018, 2019, I massively saw that and it wasn't until later on in my painting journey that I kind of made it my point of only comparing myself to myself and stop looking at all these other people. It's like you don't go to the gym for the first time when you're like overweight and then <laughs> expect to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger the next day. Yeah, like it's just you, not going to happen. You walk out after your first session and go, what, no six pack? <laughs> what a scam? Yeah. Load of rubbish. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, I do think that's really, really important. It's, it, funny enough, actually, I did a, a post um, on Instagram over the holidays uh, comparing my first model to one that I painted most recently because it was the five-year anniversary of me painting. Mm. Oh, uh, yeah, six, five years. Yeah, because it was the five-year anniversary of me painting and uh, just showing people that like, I, people see my models and I don't want people to think like, oh, that, like, that's what, you're on a completely different journey to me. You're on a completely different path. Like, why are you looking at my stuff or someone else's stuff and going like, oh, it's, it's great to have inspiration, but like, you should be looking at your own models and going, is this better than the last one if you want to improve? Not, looking at people on a completely different trajectory to you. They might have other expectations. They might have completely other different like weak points that you don't have, but you're not seeing that, especially when it's like a 2D image of like a finished model that's been worked on for a very long time by a professional or by someone who's been painting for decades and you've only been painting for two weeks. Even 
even down to, I mean, we've touched on the social media stuff before as well, where it's like, you really do have to have a, take everything with a pinch of salt and, and an image is completely different to, to seeing a model in, in hand. Sometimes they look better. Sometimes they look worse. Um, so keep all that in mind when you're scrolling through Instagram and going like, Oh, why doesn't mine look as good as that? Um, and also I think it kind of, um, I, I think it, it similar to what you're saying, where that's your generation. I think you're a good example of how that can help someone. Cause you've come obviously a long way in five years or whatever it is. Um, however, also when you're looking at for, for anyone else who for all they know, you could have had like, that might have been your first model five years ago, but you could have had a history with painting other yeah, exactly. things or, yeah. you know, um, so just cause you're posting on there and going, Oh, that's my first model. That doesn't mean that everyone's first model should look like that because mm-hmm. it's everyone, you don't know the person's background or. But equally, cause I've seen other people's posts and saying like, Oh, this is my first model. Or I've even seen like similar ones to mine and they, they look miles better than my one. But like, again, why, why am I comparing myself to them? Like you see it on all, on all levels of that. Yeah. It's, it's exactly right. Yeah. So definitely focus on improving on your last model, not someone else's first or someone else's hundredth for whatever you're seeing on Instagram. Also on that note, in terms of first models and things like that, I'm going to put this out there and say, keep your first model and do not, do not amend it or anything. Keep it. But if you, even if you're not a sentimental person, once you've finished your first model, keep it. Yeah. I wish I'd kept mine. James, do you have yours? Yeah, I've I, I've still got the first Blood Angel I ever painted, and I've still got the first Mordian Sergeant I ever painted. Yeah, and it's a reminder. It's it's a moment. Is that your? Fir- I'm talking first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Model. Yeah, no, first. Because like for me, I have I almost have two first models because I have when I painted when I was a child, mm-hmm. um, which I can't. The model that I have from that era, the model that I still have, I can't factually say that that's my first model. It might be, but there was a bunch of models in there. Um, and I'm fairly sure it, there's a chance it's my first model. I can't factually a hundred percent say it, that's my first model, but it's from the first batch that I got bought when I was a kid. And then I do have my actual hundred percent first model, um, from me getting back into painting as an adult. And I'm very glad that I kept it, um, rather than, and it's so funny to look at cause I remember looking at it going, Oh, this is easy. This looks sick. <laughs> it's so bad it's so bad um so yeah I, I feel like no one actually really talks about that no one says that and then every now and then you do see someone post like um you know this is my first model from 20 years ago or something i think you'll you'll be very glad you kept it so yeah i wish i kept mine it's in a it's in a landfill somewhere i'm sure but uh, <laughs> yeah no when i similar to- yours was like no, no, no. Similar to you. A year ago. So what, what, what that, <laughs> what's happened there? Similar to you. I painted when I was a child. I don't have those anymore. And right, then when I got right, back right. into the hobby, I painted some Space Marines and those got stripped and repainted because I, pa- I only bought a box of three models because that was all I could afford. I painted them, wasn't happy with them. I was like, well, I can't afford to buy any more models, but I've got paint. So I'm going to strip them and paint them. I think I painted those like three or four times. Yeah, I, I think... Although I'd, it's a money thing, like I would avoid stripping and repainting your first load of models if you can i completely get it's a money thing though and it's like sometimes you do just want to repaint them but you don't want to have to buy a whole load of stuff again that's obviously depends on what your situation is um because i did that with a lot of my models but i just made sure to keep keep the first one so that i had it there in my defense i wasn't supposed to get into warhammer it was supposed to be something i did on the weekend because i was bored like that weekend yeah it was like I'm going to paint some Space Marines and then that will be that and I'll move on with my life. Yeah. And here I am. <laughs> yeah, well, that's... that's t- so t- that, went, that went well. <laughs> yeah. The downside of doing that is if you're going to strip models and paint them over and over and over again, it is going to make you a better painter. And I guess in the long run, I'm glad that I'd done that because I'd, I'd rather be a good painter than still have that model and never gotten into it, right? But even though that is going to make you better, it's only going to make you better at painting that model. It's only going to make you pe- better at painting that texture in that context, if you get what I mean, it's only going to take you so far. I think that one of the big mistakes a lot of people make is sticking in their lane too much, um, especially when you're a bit more seasoned in the hobby 
maybe you've got an army under your belt or you like to go quite a long way into painting an army and you're not seeing big gains. If you're just painting the same stuff continuously over and over and over again, we've spoken to death about this before on the podcast, but I think that's a mistake that people make. Yeah. Comfort zone. It's, it's sticking within your comfort zone and not pushing out of it. It's the biggest enemy. And I say this all the time to people on classes um, or when we do on my intuition or anything like that. Like, you know, the opening question is always, oh, so what, what armies do you collect? Or, you know, what, how long have you been painting? Or like, you know, tell me what your favorite things are, blah, blah, blah. And like, you'll often find that people do stick within their comfort zone. They'll do a Marine army or they'll do like a guard army or they'll do like a, this army, whatever, but then they don't touch anything that's like organic or they don't do anything that's this type of, these type of colors. They don't, you know, it's, it's very common and we're all guilty of it because we fall in love with these factions, armies, miniatures, whatever, and, and just, stay within them i guess the problem as well is like if you're not drawn to something else it can be difficult to be like i'm just going to paint this for the sake of it because it's different like if you're not in love with the models it can be a bit of a chore and i do totally get that as well and that's why i put it off for the longest time i also don't want to like act like we're blind to the fact that obviously people are trying to build an army mm -hmm. so they're going to be painting the same thing over and over again but like i think when you're starting i think there's a level of it where it is helpful if you're going to paint like a small army when you're starting, that's that's definitely helpful. But I spoke before about how I wish I got away from Space Marines quicker. Yeah. Because for a while, like, I'd only painted Space Marines. And then even outside of that, I'd only painted Death Guard, which is like just the pretty Space Marine for what yeah. they are. There's some few extra textures and things on there, but a couple more wibbly bits. Yeah. And then when I eventually then had like an Elder Guardian in front of me. I was like, oh my God, this is tiny. And I felt like I was painting my first model again. Do you know what I mean? Like, whereas I wish earlier on I had a bit more variety, but there, there's a, it's, it's, it's difficult because there's like a bit of a sweet spot to hit. I think you don't want to just instantly be jumping around. Yeah, I agree. I think one of the other things which that we're all guilty of it, and I think, oh, well, maybe George isn't, but um, I was going to say, if I, if this is going where I think it's going, I think you're guilty of it more than more than us. So I've just been talking about it. He's been cheering. He's been celebrating at the start <laughs> of the episode about how good at this he is. I, I am quite quite good at doing this particular thing, which I advise people not to do. But um, but yeah, uh, buying loads and loads and loads and loads of models and building up a cupboard uh, with an S in in brackets at the end uh cupboards uh, of uh, of miniatures um so generous i said cupboard singular yeah, yeah. only the one yeah. don't worry it's not yeah. out of hand it's not my entire house you're not fooling anyone yeah no i know I, I am pretty guilty of that but the thing is it's like that i think not doing that is really it is, is really important getting like a uh getting like a um a set or a miniature and painting it that should be the reward for then getting the next one rather than Having a mounting. Of Look at him <laughs> trying to keep a straight face while saying this. <laughs> yeah, it is difficult. I'll be honest. Yeah. I'm going to like clip this for Re and she can play it to you every time you, yeah. you buy a new stuff. We should do one of those episodes. You know, it's like, uh, you know, those couples games where they're like, they'll isolate the couples and they'll ask them both the same question. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what do you think of James will have a collection? Yeah. James, how bad do you think your problem is? <laughs> yeah. How bad do you think your addiction is? Yeah. The, what I will say is, and I don't want to enable... Uh, enable all you like. Enable... Yeah. Yeah everyone and specifically James on buying new models. But in general, if you keep them in their box and stuff, they do hold their value. Like you're not going to be out. You're not going to be like, they're not going to be sitting there like depreciating. I think a lot of people do what you did with your Necron army of, I'm going to buy this whole army. I'm going to build it. Or I'm going to prime it all thinking you're going to do it all in one go. And then they lose motivation later on in the project, which is why I said to James, I mean, he had his little admec escapade a couple of weeks ago. Just do the one model, see if it scratches the itch, then you can buy the army. So that, uh, I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> but that's where you can get into a bit of a problem, I think, because in terms of money wise, I was just trying to touch on the fact that like, if it's just a load of boxes sitting there sealed, like sometimes you can even end up in the plus money wise if that's you end, true. Up, if you end up selling true. them a few years later because they've gone out of production or that something. can be one of the excuses that he uses uh he uses for race like they're going up in value oh that's 100 percent one of the excuses he already uses i guarantee it but hey, like uh, i i i have got a collection of older stuff that i will not open and that is that is you know that is a future um uh, it's not a collection, James. It's investment. It's an investment. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's uh, you, you'll see me on um. Oh god, I can't remember what the program's called. 
What's the oh, he's been cool. I know, keep, I mean, it cool. Yeah, keep, keep it in. Keep it in. What's the program? Um, uh, what, in? No, when you, no, program. no. When you when no when you see when you see they take the, the bargain the, hunters. Yeah, things. no. When they take it to that show and they go, oh, the value of this is blah blah. blah uh, oh, uh, antiques roadshow. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, uh, one at one point or another. Uh, yeah, I, it does hold its value quite well. And also the thing is, is like if you've made it, built built it, cleaned it, and you, maybe you're just sitting on a shelf like made or whatever, you can still sell it and make good money on it. Like it holds its value, as we said. But the thing is, is also. I know I've been there many a time where I've like, for example, with the guard army, sorry to segue into it again, but I've wanted a Lee man Russell or two or a couple of chimeras or something like that. Do I want to go out and buy a new kit and spend half an hour building it? I can, I can buy, buy one on eBay. That's maybe, you know, uh, a, a little bit cheaper, you know, potentially, you know, or it has a rare forge world out of production turret on it or something like that. Like, and it's made, so I don't need to spend the time I'm saving the time doing it. And it's been made to a standard that I'm happy with or whatever. Like, you know, you, you, you can always get rid of it, I think, if that is a problem. Like, you know, if you do get the Everest of grey shame piles like I unfortunately have. But um, but um, but yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's something that, that is important to just take into consideration when you are starting out is to not go like super crazy into into buying everything under the sun. As difficult as it is, and I feel yeah. you're paying 100%. So. I just, I do, I do wonder if it is, if buying too many models is at the level of, unrealistic as as a thing to say don't buy too many models because it's just literally everyone does it mm. it's just in the nature of like what i think there's actually a fourth pillar to this hobby which is collecting which people don't really talk about everyone yeah. says like, oh you like the painting or you like the game or you like the law i think people just like having stuff yeah people... and i don't i don't mean that in a negative sense at all like people love collecting stuff like people got all sorts of collections for different things i think it is that part of it um i think that's why we're all like addicted to buying this stuff right so it's just fun to collect. Do you know that that's one of the reasons I got back into it as an adult was at the time I was trying to figure out like, yeah, I wanted to like collect something cool and I didn't really have, like I used to have like a huge like record collection and that's like, was like two, but even compared to, to Warhammer, no exaggeration. If you're having a legit good record collection, very expensive. expensive yeah. Um, and it got that got to the point where like even new records were like are so expensive now because all the major labels start jumping on it again. So I was like looking for like, oh, you know. What's I something, something chicks really like? What's like something? all these records oh, they're just not working was, out for I was me. not doing it to get chicks. <laughs> I was not doing it to get chicks. Um, never said chicks in my life, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I thought, oh, like that would be cool to have like a nice like display cabinet collection, whatever. So yeah, it's definitely a hundred percent part of it. And, uh, and I, I fall into that, I would say. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Um, yeah, I'm not going to lie. Like my, most, most of the stuff that I do have that's sealed is just a collection. It is just nice just to have those things from my childhood that I used to walk into a games workshop and see, you know, sealed on the shelf. You know, uh, there's a lot of things that I've got, which I, I've, you know, I'm I've probably got no intention of opening ever, but you are quite right. Like having that collection or having those things that are sealed, it's just it's just nice to have, and it's just yeah, it's just nostalgia for me, yeah. I suppose. But so yeah. James, James doesn't have grey shame; he has grey pride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one thing that I would say off of that as well is hoarding and buying loads of equipment. I think people get a lot of like tall FOMO in uh in Warhammer, if you get what I mean, like. You see these videos and someone's got this like cool gadget or gizmo that uh, that you see someone else using. You think like, oh, if I've got that, then I'll be out paint like them. Or if I've got that brush or if I've got that tool. Um, sometimes your tools are fighting you. And I think you said this, Joe, you said like, you'll know when you're ready for the next thing. Mm. If you didn't know about it until this morning, you probably don't need it. Like 99 times out, out of 100, you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you realize in... The, the way you're going to realize that you need to upgrade your equipment is through something that you're doing, not through you seeing a YouTube video and someone else is using something else. Do you know what I mean? Like that you'll, you'll know when you need to upgrade it. And it, again, it comes down to, I, I'm very like fond of thinking of it, not just in miniature painting, but in, in general over the last, however many years as I've kind of grown up a little bit, I've like realized that in terms of equipment to do something, the best thing is just what you have. Like that's stop worrying about, Oh, I can't do it because I need X, Y, Z equipment. Like if you've got something and you're just deeming it not good enough, 
it's fine. Just use the the not good enough thing for a little bit. Like you'll know when you need to upgrade it. I think as well, it's the difference between like upgrading something and getting a new thing. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. sometimes you might have a brush and you're like, oh, my brush isn't great. And then you watch a video and they've got a really nice brush and you're like, oh, th that's like a natural transition, right? Like, oh, I didn't know this brush existed. That might fix this problem that I have. But when it's like some product that you're not even using, it's not a part of your workflow anyway. Like there might be, there's been some odd cases where like you do genuinely find stuff, but like, like I said, if you didn't hear about it until this morning, then it's probably not going to solve some problem that you've yeah. got. It's definitely not going to make you a better painter. Like putting the hours in is what's going to make you a better painter. I think all I'm trying to get across is that as long as you have the essentials covered, you can paint your models. Yeah, fine. completely agree. Especially as a beginner. So, 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 so basically don't go out and buy a brand new airbrush, top of the range airbrush compressor because you've watched one YouTube video, uh, or, YouTube video or whatever the case may be. I think I think when you're first starting out, the, the core competencies, brushes, paints, a couple of spray cans will, will serve you extremely well. And to touch upon your point about brushes as well, it's something that's quite interesting. Like you may see people using whatever manufacturer of paintbrush, but much like with paint where different batches of paint will have diff different chemical compositions, like a lot of high-end brushes are all handmade. Like you don't know if the one that that person's got, who's got holds a head perfectly is made by the same person in, in, that, that's handmade the one that you've made. And maybe there's a slight discrepancy in the way the hair has been folded or whatever the case may be, or crimped, for example. But not only like, that, like some people like softer brushes, some people like firmer brushes, some people have got like, naturally they want to apply more pressure with their hand. Like it's, it's a tailored thing to the individual. But I think it's a good idea to like maybe try out an experiment with your own products and see what works best for you. But it's like we said earlier with like uh, just blindlessly blindly following what other people are doing, like stopping and sitting and thinking and working out like what it is you want to get out of something. Like if you're everything in your paint, don't just do it because someone else told you to do it with the brushes. It's like, just cause they've got that brush doesn't necessarily mean that you need that brush. It's not, yeah. the, it's not the reason. One of the things that I'm continuously astonished at is how many like incredible painters, golden demon winners, competition painters, their setups are always so simple. It's the one thing that I always find that they have in common. Yeah. It's so funny. Like when you realize how it's good, well, they're spending less time worrying about that and more time painting. Mm -hmm. Like if that's one of the things that you're spending a lot of time thinking about, you know, um, again, it's the, it's the, um, lazy procrastination or la lazy perfectionist thing that mm -hmm. I touched on before where it's like, okay, well, I want to paint this model perfectly. And in order to do that, I need all this equipment. So I'm not going to start painting right now. I'm going to wait till I've got all this equipment and then I'm going to paint the perfect model. Uh, whereas like all these top painters will have a really simple setup and all that time that you've just wasted accruing this equipment that you don't know how to use, they've spent painting the model. Like it is, it is funny. Like uh, we've all been there. Like I've definitely been there, but I think accepting that you just need the the basics and just cracking on with it, I think is is very beneficial. I think at the end of the day, like a tool should solve a problem. It shouldn't like be a gimmick. You know what I mean? Especially. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You'll get to a point I'm sure where it's like, I just want to buy some cool stuff, which is fine, but don't do it right at the beginning. If you're thinking, oh, that's going to improve my painting. Yeah. Don't do it to your, don't do it lying to yourself saying that it's going to make you better, especially if you know deep down that it's, it's not right. Yeah. Especially in a hobby that's expensive enough anyway. You know what I mean? Like save the money where you can like, at the start. Definitely. On that point as well, actually, I realized that we've done uh, one of the earlier episodes on this show was uh, talking about just painting equipment, our little hidden gems, stuff that we like to use. Yeah. Yeah, we did some like overrated, underrated opinions on on things there, so that's probably worth a worth a listen for any beginner. Big news: tickets are now on sale for the Siege Studios painting classes for 2024. For over eight years, we've been running in-depth, hands-on classes across the UK, which has allowed us to create the perfect learning environment for improving your painting skills. With a variety of topics available, all our courses are taught by senior artists and feature practical demonstrations in a relaxed environment that welcomes interaction from you, discussions on theory, and an open Q&A session so you can ask that burning question you've had on your mind. You can even bring your models for feedback. To book now and reserve your place before tickets set out, head over to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. I'll see you on a class soon. Question of the week time. Thank you very much for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on the show, please leave it in the comments on YouTube. If you're listening on the go on one of the audio platforms, you can fire us a DM on Instagram. And as well, uh, for our Discord members, if you want to join the Siege Studios Discord, we have a uh, exclusive topic suggestion and questions area on there as well. Uh, this question comes from Redco86, who says, Gents, please help a brother out. Love how this one starts. <laughs> Is that one of those... Uh, 
There's a hotlines. Uh, halved slash quartered schemes. Any tips on how to progress these and similarly tricky paint jobs? Would love to hear any tips you have to approaching this. My current stab at it is lightest color first, complete the paint job, then overpaint in the darker color and finish those areas. Yeah, I 100% uh, agree with starting with a light color. And that was actually going to be the first thing that I suggested. I think doing the lighter color out of the two first is always better because then when you obviously then paint the secondary, where it's, if it's quartered, um, then obviously the diagonal is, is you have to get that bang on seamless. And I think that's one of the first two, the two first things I'd suggest are lighter color scheme first or lighter colors first, followed by then painting the darker color on. And when you do paint the darker color on, I'd always personally add a bit more of the first stage color. So the lighter color, almost like a bleed or an extra area to work in so that you can overlay that to the point of meeting in the middle, if that makes sense. Like if you That's a good if idea. you work the other way, it, it's a lot harder to get the seamless line. Whereas obviously overlapping the darker onto the lighter, it's all, always easier to put a dark color on top of a lighter color. But if you create a bleed area, almost like a safe zone, if you want to call it anything, it means that you know you can cut into that to then create the seamless part. Does that make sense? Like mm. I've, we, we, you know, I painted um, uh, some, I can't remember what they're called now, uh, red and blue brazen claws in the past. I've done one of those. Um, cause I like the scheme. Um, and, and yeah, I, I made the error of starting with the, the dark blue first, whereas I should have started with the red. Um, you know, it, yeah, it, as I said, like, you know, creating a bleed area or a safe zone when you put the first color on allows you to then sketch in the secondary darker color and create that seamless straight concentric line, which whether it's quartered or halved, whichever you prefer. That's a good idea with the bleed line. I don't think I'd have thought of that. I've not actually got any experience with like split schemes like that, but immediately my mind is ticking and thinking this screams sub assembly. If there was ever a time to do sub assembly so that you can prime everything <laughs> in separate colors, leave the arms off if they're going to be a different color, surely. You, you, I think it worked true. Agreed. Also though, I would ask like, at what point is an airbrush? Like, would you airbrush any of this and yeah. then like block stuff? Like, and then like mask stuff. I guess you've got two ways you could go about that. You could either do it all like one half of the color in terms of your like airbrush primer or do the, the masking thing, right? Because you're going to have to, you're going to have to get the brush in there at I some think point. If I, I've never done it, but if I, I think if I was going to attempt it, I would probably airbrush, if I was doing like straight down the middle, for example, like split down the middle, I'd probably airbrush both of them with some masking and then just tidy the line up afterwards. But I would personally airbrush the brighter color on and then focus on the side of the model or the area, if you're doing quartered, uh, of the model uh, with that lighter color. So I would focus on that, airbrush that on, and then I'd actually brush on the other color with a normal brush rather than airbrush mm. because you're going to have to be thin anyway. You can get a really nice, smooth, seamless finish by doing it that way. The moment you start, it only takes that that masking tape to be slightly off center, and your whole entire impact of the half and half or quarter and quarter 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 that the that whole impact of quarter the, quarter the quarter quarter yeah that whole impact of the quartered scheme or half scheme is lost because that line is not perfectly straight. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm so, still I'm saying like you'd still tidy it up, tidy the actual line up. You do the actual line probably. Do you, do you know Do you know brush. why I, I I personally recommend you do one half airbrush, one half with brush. It's because the airbrush is going to give you a certain finish on the one side and then the air, uh, the brush, it, it, you can get it very close to being an airbrush, but the, the issue is, is that look slightly different. it's going to look slightly different. I think that's one of those things that depends how picky you are about that sort of stuff. Because exactly, this is an yeah. argument that I hear all the time of like, oh, even if I airbrush all the model blue, I'll still go in after and paint the whole model blue with a brush because it's like easy to cover up mistakes and stuff like that. And I totally get that. But if you're going at it from the angle of like speed or efficiency, or you're just okay with it looking like, a little bit different like if you're not painting for display like i i do personally think that that is a massive time sink trade for a very very small return and i would rather have spent all of that time wasted on like we discussed in a previous episode putting into nice little details that will actually make the model pop a lot more i do think there's potentially not much crossover between people prioritizing speed and people doing a quartered scheme though like if someone's trying to get something done fast, I don't think they're going to be doing a quartered scheme, are they? They're going to be picking like what all one color. So I suppose so, but I'm sure there's like some context of like I would like to get this army done like within this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, but like 
I do think you know what you're signing up for if you're picking an army of a quarter scheme. Like, I agree with that, but I, I, I just meant in the sense of like, if you've got a limited amount of time on it, regardless of if you're like trying to do it in a rush, like because like you said, yeah. you wouldn't have picked a quarter scheme if you wanted to get it done like super quick. Fair enough, but I'm just saying it's less of a concern probably than when we're talking about getting things done with other armies, it's probably less of a concern. I agree with that, but I just meant in the sense of like we discussed on a previous episode, if you've got, if you look at the amount of time that you've got as a whole, you're probably better off spending that time investing it in other details on the model rather than painting what's already been painted. Yeah, Just because yeah. it's going to give you a slightly different surface finish. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Next up, Hobby Hacks. This is our weekly closing tradition where we share a little hobby hack, little nuggets of information with you. Uh, if you're new to the show, you might have seen a couple of weeks ago over Christmas, we put out a little compilation episode of all of our top hobby hacks. Uh, starting off 2024 with a bang, James, I'm sure you've got something ready for us. So yeah, so I got quite a good one this week. Um, so kind of in relation to what we were talking about, the over thinning of paint earlier in the episode, um, this one's a bit appropriate for it. So if you are thinning paint, be it on a palette or potentially, I use this more when I'm using the paint for the airbrush or airbrushing models. Um, if I thin it a little bit too too thin, I'm not talking like drastically too thin, but if I put, if it's just a touch, rather than adding a bit more paint into the mix, I'll actually add a tiny bit of satin varnish into into the paint uh, or into the mix. And what that does is it just it, it just tightens the bonds between the pigment a little bit in that in the mix of paint, um, which I find helps just to put it together a little bit better. Um, and that works really, really well. On my uh, Mordians, which I was airbrushing, I used obviously Enchanted Blue. I thinned loads of it down and I found it was just a little bit too thin when I made like a large batch of it. So I just put in a tiny bit of satin varnish into that mix, gave it a blast on my Vortex mixer just to mix it and get it obviously fully mixed into the into the, into the the paint and the medium. Um, and then it went on like a dream, went on smooth as anything. The other sort of like silver lining of that is that you're actually putting a tiny bit of varnish in with the paint, which is actually increasing the strength of the paint as in the, for the, the surface finish of it does make it obviously a little bit satin. You can always change the finished property with another varnish at the end if you want, but it just makes that paint a little bit stronger as well. Obviously in the tree of or tree or process of, of varnishes, your matte is your weakest, your gloss is your, is your strongest, but satin being in the middle, it just helps add a bit of strength to your paint as well and protection to your paint for that, for that main base coat that you're going to place on. Um, obviously I've been painting metal models. So having a stronger, better wearing paint on, as my base coat helps massively with chipping and scratching and all those kind of things. I'm intrigued actually as to specifically what varnish products work well for that. Cause funny enough, I kind of do the opposite. I've got obviously like some varnishes are like thicker in the bottle than others, right? Like somebody diluting, whatever. I actually use some of my varnishes in the opposite direction as a glazing medium to thin my paints. That's quite interesting actually. It's good. I mean, I, I've never used it in that way. I've always used it to kind of like just, pull the bonds and the paint a little bit better together. Um, and I found it always works for me. But I suppose um, it depends, like I say, like the, the actual viscosity of the of the product that you're using, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I use the Vallejo polyurethane. So they're quite, they're a bit gloopy. They're quite, they're quite, uh, tacky thick. yeah so they I, I don't use like an airbrush varnish or anything like that it's it needs to be thinned it's quite a, quite a strong product which is why for me it does pull the bonds of pigment closer together and just makes a better overall coverage on the miniatures um and as i said the silver lining is that it protects that paint a little bit it gives it makes the paint a little bit tougher and just actually just stops it from wearing as much on the surface as well um and then obviously look i think do i do an overlapping gloss varnish over the whole model after i've done that so it has multiple stages of protection as you're adhering the paint to the model um but yeah that's my hobby hat for this week just uh just uh strengthen your paint a little bit and also help with if you've thinned it a little bit too thin and you just want to just pull the bonds of pigment together with some varnish in the mix but yeah well on that note let's round out the show thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of paint perspective if you want to support the show you can do so in a number of ways uh, mainly, we have the Siege Studios Patreon over there. You'll gain access to a bunch of PDF tutorials and videos. And we also have a tier just for podcast listeners. And you also gain access to an exclusive members area on the Siege Studios Discord. Thank you, everyone, so much. We will see you next week. Bye.